Okay, the third and final part of our overview of Android, which is just meant to give you a bird's eye view, which we'll fill in in much more technical detail here shortly, is on the last couple layers in the Android stack. And those layers are the application framework layer and the applications layer, or the apps layer. Before we talk about the application framework layer, though, it's probably useful to know a little bit more about what an application framework is, <laughs> because otherwise it's a little hard to understand why they have a layer about it. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about what an application framework is first, and then I'll show you how Android has a bunch of them. It, it actually should be called the application frameworks layer, because there's a bunch of frameworks, not just one. So we'll talk about what an application framework is. We'll talk about the common system services that are implemented in the Android application framework layer. Uh, and a lot of this stuff is, are things that you'll quickly become familiar with if you start doing any Android programming whatsoever. Although as an end user of apps, you might not know or care that some of these things are here. We'll also talk about some of the common applications that are available. You undoubtedly know those if you have an Android phone, hopefully, because you probably use them all the time. So let's start by talking about the application framework concept. So what is a framework? Uh, a framework is an integrated set of components that provide a reasonable architecture for a family of related applications. And you can look here for more discussion about what frameworks are from an article I wrote many, many years ago, about 20 years ago, describing the concept for a special issue of the communications of the ACM. And uh, there's a bunch of things that a framework provides. I'll talk about that in more detail later. In a nutshell, a framework typically has three things. It has so-called inversion of control. And that's basically shown here, where the framework owns the event loop, and it calls back to various handlers when things of interest to the application occur. So it's got inversion of control. Second thing it has is so-called domain-specific structure and functionality. So that means it's got classes and relationships between those classes in terms of subclassing or composition or whatever. And these things are specific for a particular domain. For example, here is the set of classes that are part of the Android asynchrony frameworks. And these are domain specific for that world, right? So we've got a looper, we've got a message queue, and a message, and a handler. And that's sort of Android specific. There are also some more generic things like runnables and executors and so on. But all this stuff kind of works together to provide concurrency for Android devices. So that's the domain-specific part, the domain of Android devices. And then the third thing that you have with a framework is something that's called a semi-complete application. And what that means is that a lot of the code is provided for you. Again, you can see there's lots of classes. And those classes have lots of methods and lots of fields and lots of behavior. And you just have to fill in a few blanks, which are called hook methods. So the, the run method, for example, in the, thread, in the thread world, we just talked about run is a hook method. You have to implement it or subclass it or override it or whatnot in order to get it to do something interesting for your application. And then you get all the rest of the framework for free. But the framework obviously doesn't know what you're going to do when your thread runs. It just knows that it'll create a thread and then arrange to have your hook method called. So those are the three things, the inversion of control, application or domain-specific functionality and structure, and semi-complete applications where there are hooks left in to be overridden and filled in. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of examples of frameworks that you've been working with all, all semester. And there'll be even more as we look more into Android, because Android is chock full of frameworks. So here's typically how the framework style of programming behaves. It uses something called event loops, an event-driven paradigm. So what you do is you have this event-driven programming model to allow you to plug application code, which you would typically write, into framework code, which someone else typically wrote on your behalf. So how do those two worlds come together? And why do we need them in the first place? Well, the whole point of this is to enhance systematic reuse. And that just means, you know, rather than cutting and pasting stuff opportunistically as you see the need for it, 
someone really spent the time to figure out that application-specific structure and functionality, put the inversion of control in to the framework, and then leave hook methods for you to override or plug in to reuse everything that's already there. So there's a lot less work on your, on your part. All right, so typically an application will register some kind of callback object, called callbacks for short. And these objects are going to handle certain kinds of events, depending on the, how the framework behaves, right? So when we get it more into Android, you'll see that there's these things called activities. And an activity has a whole bunch of events that it wants the application to be aware of and it knows when they occur, but it doesn't know what to do with them, right? So you have various events that say, the activity is starting, the activity is stopping, the activity is created, the activity is terminated, the activity is pausing, the activity is resuming, right? These are all examples of things that the Android activity manager and windowing system and so on keep track of on your behalf, and it knows that they're happening. It doesn't know what the heck you're, you're gonna do about it, it just knows that they've occurred and you better know what to do with it so it calls you back, it does callbacks, and you register your activity object, and it calls you back when things happen. And we'll see more examples of that. Similar kind of thing with threads, right? You use subclass thread, or you implement runnable, and the thread framework knows when the thread is created, and it's ready to go, but it doesn't know what you want to do, so it calls your hook method, called run, and that's where you do your stuff, right? So you register your application objects for events, like I want to be told when the activity is about to go away, et cetera, or I want to be told when the thread is ready to run, et cetera. And then the framework uh, will receive the object passed from the application code to the framework, and the, and the framework holds onto it somehow, puts it in an internal container. And then the framework will wait for things to happen. And typically during that period, the application code is not running. The framework is sitting in its event loop waiting for stuff to happen. And usually that stuff is lower level stuff, right? So it's waiting for network events to show up. It's waiting for the user to click or press part of the screen. It's waiting for a timer to go off. You know, whatever it's doing, it's waiting, right? On your behalf, on the application's behalf. And whenever something occurs that the framework knows about and knows your application callbacks are interested in, then the framework will dispatch a callback in order to be able to inform your code that an event of interest has occurred. And then, of course, it's your code's responsibility to do something about that. And that's where your logic is. So right away, hopefully, you get the concept of semi-complete application, right? There's a lot of stuff going on over here in the framework that you don't know, you don't care. So that's the semi-complete application. But there's some things you've got to be part of, like the business logic, and that's where the magic happens when it calls you back. So that's that little dance that's going back and forth between these different levels of abstraction. After the callback is done with its application-centric thing, then the control returns to the framework, and it then waits for the next event to occur. And if you think about how a, a user interface app is written, it's spending a lot of its time waiting for you to do the next thing, right? You press a button, something happens, you do something else, something happens, you know, like browsing a web or selecting buttons or running a web crawler, whatever you're doing, the UI is waiting for you to give it things to do. And you just keep, you know, lather, rinse, repeat, you keep doing this over and over again until the whole application is done, whatever done means in this context. It could mean many different things. It's also worth pointing out that Frameworks are not just for user-level applications. You can also have frameworks for systems-level things as well. For example, the operating system kernel, the Linux operating system kernel, has a device driver framework where people who write hardware, people who build hardware devices, write the software drivers that manage and control those hardware devices. And the framework that is in the kernel is pretty low level. But it's a framework nonetheless, and it's got various entry point methods. It's all written in C, by the way. It's got methods like open, close, poll, read, write, all that kind of good stuff. And if you look at the implementations, they have pointers to C functions that are put in tables and stored in structures that are used to dispatch those framework uh, callbacks 
when the operating system detects certain things happening at the hardware level. So frameworks apply up and down the stack. When we talk about an application framework with Android, we think about it sort of from the application developer's perspective, but it's really frameworks all the way down, just like uh, the famous turtles all the way down, right? Um, OK, so that's a quick overview of what an app framework is. Let's now talk about Android's application framework and apps layers, which are the two highest layers in the Android stack. So basically, the application framework layer contains a bunch of frameworks, which are then instantiated and run as so-called system services. And as we'll see, system services are used to provide apps with various information and capabilities that they need in order to do their thing. Uh, and if you take a look at some of the examples here, it'll become pretty clear what they do. So uh, one of the system services in the application framework layer is the window manager. Well, that's an important thing, right? The thing that handles user interface interactions and manages windows. And of course, as you probably know, with newer versions of Android, you can actually have multiple windows. It used to be that an activity took up the entire screen and couldn't be resized. With newer versions of Android, you can actually resize the activities. So you can literally have windows. They're kind of crufty and weird. They're not like windows on your, your desktop or your laptop, but they're windows nonetheless. So there's a window manager. There's a telephony manager, which obviously manages the, the phone-related stuff, right? Um, if you're on a smartphone, at least. There's something called the package manager, which manages your, your apps, your APK files, application packages. So anytime you download an app from the Play Store, it comes as a package. And the package manager is responsible for unpacking it and putting it and registering it on the phone. There's things that manage uh, persistent interactions, content providers, something that keeps track of where your phone is, the location manager, something that notifies various parts of the system when interesting things occur. Like if you get mail, you might get a, a new count in your app icon badge, or you might get something to the notification or status bar at the top of the phone. That's the notification manager. And then there's something else called the activity manager. And we'll spend a little bit of time on that, because uh, it's kind of cool. So if you step back from all these different system services, they are used to expose hardware and Linux OS capabilities to applications at a higher level than programming device drivers, which is hideous and tedious and error prone. So why do that when you can have a nice Java framework to manage it for you? These system services run continuously. You know, When your phone boots up, there's a window manager, there's an activity manager, there's a package manager. And those things run all the time. If uh, they crash, the system knows how to restart them. There's a watchdog, super server kind of thing that keeps track of them. And of course, the internal control flow of all this stuff, because they're frameworks, are driven by events and callbacks. So just like everything else in Android. One of the most interesting system services is the Activity Manager, um, which, like almost all the other services, is largely written in Java with some C and C++ native code for things that need to run efficiently. And the Activity Manager service is used to interact, even though it's called the Activity Manager. It actually manages activities, services, and broadcast receivers, so all the sorts of things that take place, these Android components in your system, the activity manager is kind of the policeman or police person that time slices and manages and coordinates the launching and execution of all these things. So it's, it's actually very, very cool. It's, it's gigantically huge piece of code, but very, very powerful. And then, of course, at the very top of all this is really what matters for most of us, unless you're an app developer, are the apps. So these are the things that we typically use every day. Um, most of these apps are written in Java. You can write some, or, some of them or, or some parts of them in C and C++. And I think I mentioned the other day that uh, Kotlin is becoming very popular as a programming language for Android, which you can see if you go here. It's fully supported in the newer versions of Android Studio and the Android programming environment, the Android platform. Um, has anybody here ever programmed with Kotlin, out of curiosity? A little bit. So, one thing I'm hoping we'll do next semester is we'll uh, have a little bit more focus on Kotlin. It's, it's a really interesting language. It's, it's kind of like uh, they took Java and, and changed the syntax a bit to look not quite so Java-esque, but it's still sort of in the general vein of Java-like things. 
Um, and they got rid of some of the weird quirks that Java has, like just this one simple example. There's no concept of a null pointer anymore, whereas Java can have null pointers even though it doesn't have pointers. There's null pointer exceptions. So they, they clean up some things. And according to people who are big Kotlin evangelists, you can write more concise code more rapidly using Kotlin than using Java. Andrew? Is Kotlin something primarily for Android, or is it it's, it's used. It, it's usable generally. Uh, you can use Kotlin on an iPhone, for example. Actually, Kotlin looks a lot like Swift. If you've ever worked with the Swift language, which is on iOS, it has a similar kind of flavor to it. And uh, one of the cool things about Kotlin, but yes, you can use Kotlin for lots of other stuff besides Android. Um, one of the nice things about Kotlin is that you can call Java code. Any Java code can be called from Kotlin. So all the Java libraries that already exist are available with Kotlin bindings right out of the box which is actually, to some extent, a bit the way that C++ worked in the early days. If you probably weren't born then, but back in the 80s, when it first came out, C++'s big claim to fame was that you could take your legacy C libraries and encapsulate them with C++, and then you could be productive with higher level abstractions without having to throw away everything you've done. So Kotlin is kind of the same idea. right? You can reuse a lot of Java. Um, and I think I mentioned this before. If you really want to have your brain explode with super cool Kotlin stuff, Take a look at the UI portion, the, the app portion of our web crawler app that you've used as the skeletons for the assignments. Go look at the app directory, and you'll see that that's all written in Kotlin. And uh, it's really, 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 really powerful stuff. Um, so next semester, we may go through some of that as well, just to give people a little flavor of how that works. All right, so that's an overview of 